Well, here it is again, but this talk is not really about me. But here are a few facts. I'm a fanatic in one respect. I'm a fanatic about UX certification. Now, if you want to know more about this, uh, go to this reference, uxqb.org, where you can re read a lot about it. And then I'm also a member of the UXPA Ethical Committee. So I'm actually involved in this kind of work. I must say, though, that for the past 10 years, the committee has not met. So there's not a lot of activity in this area. All right. So, but before we start, I have a few personal credos, a few things that I sincerely believe in. And just to frame my talk, I'd like to start by showing these to you. Number one, if the users can't use it, it doesn't work. That's the number one belief that I have. Number two, don't be evil. Now, that may sound very simple, but believe me, in just a moment, I'm going to challenge you on this one. Because it's not so evil, uh, it's not so simple, because there's another one. Sometimes it's necessary to say no and face the consequences. And that's the dilemma that I want to show you in just a moment. And I also believe, I don't have that on the slide, I also believe that UX presentations got to be useful. And that means audience involvement. So, get ready. <laughs> right, so, and we're actually starting right now. So, whatever device you have, please go to shakeq.com and enter the code ethics. Now, if you don't get it here, it will be repeated on the following slides. I will give you a number of challenges, a number of dilemmas to vote on, and you will need your smartphone for this purpose. So it's shakeq.com and ethics. If you didn't get it, it will reappear in the bottom of each of the voting slides. All right, so the first dilemma I have is speak up or go along. Right, the dilemma is here. You are a manager of an HCI group with a product that's almost through the better process. At the last customer visit, a problem which could have catastrophic consequences for some customers is observed. The next day is sign off for the product. The director of the pro project asks each manager if the product is ready and they all say yes. You stand to lose a $10,000 bonus if you say no and delay the product release. So here's my dilemma. Here's my challenge for you. Do you bring the potential defect? Do you bring up the potential defect? and ask for a delay in the product until you confirm your suspicions. And here's the voting slide. Hopefully, if the whole thing is usable and the technique works, you should now see these questions here appearing on your whatever device you have. Please touch the answer, and you will only get one chance, I'm afraid. Please touch the answer that you consider right. Oh, wow, the counter is really showing some activity in this room. That's good. Only vote once. Thank you. So let's move on and see what came up. All right, speak up and ask for a delay, 61. It depends, 22. No, go along, five. All right, fair enough. I don't have the final answer for this one. I would probably, myself, have spoken up and asked for a delay. But the incentive in itself is inherently unethical. It's not reasonable to ask people to do this kind of stuff. Because they, the boss, the manager, will not get an honest answer to his question. He, will, he or she will not get the, question, the answer that they really want. And of course, you don't deserve a bonus for shipping an unusable product. Another day, we can talk about what the people who voted for It Depends actually said. 
because, and with all due respect for those who voted, it depends, I think it depends is a rather unusable answer. <laughs> right, so, number two, to bluff or not. Here's the dilemma. You found some problems in usability testing. While none are critical, you feel that several are important and you'd like to see them fixed before the release. Because the development schedule is extremely tight, only high priority changes are being made. So my question to you is, is it ethical to overstate the severity of problems in order to get changes made? And here's the voting slide. Yes, thank you. Let's have a look at this one. No problem at all. It's very nice to see such a couple, such a room full of very honest people who would really report everything accurately. Well, I just, it's, it's good. I would probably have done the same thing. But I must confess that over the years, there has probably been one or two occasions where I wouldn't have been totally willing to defend the severity that I gave to a usability problem. All right. It's okay to overstate severity. You have a problem, uh, responsibility to make the product as usable as possible under a situation of serious resource constraints. Without bluffing, you'll accomplish nothing. I'm not sure I agree with that one. I certainly have accomplished quite a bit of things during my years without bluffing. Bluffing undermines your credibility, say the no-sayers, the naysayers. If you bluff, then your colleagues, who are usually very smart people, will quickly find out that you are bluffing and then it becomes a competition of uh, escalating bluffs. So it's not a good idea for that very reason. And that's one of the things that I've learned working in this field for many, many years. Your colleagues are extremely smart. You cannot outwit them. Number five, number three, abide by the hippo or say no. That's a totally unusable uh, header, but I'll explain. So let me present to you the boss the manager. Now, what's the manager saying? And I've been talking to people here during the breaks, and it seems that some of the managers are saying things like, I want, news, I want users to sign up for our newsletter by default. Or, I want a carousel on the homepage of our website. Or, I want a flaming goat to walk across the homepage every 30 seconds. That's what bosses say. The interesting thing is, oh yeah, we have a name for that. It's called a hippo, the highest paid person's opinion. <laughs> and such hippos are hard to come up against. Now, once when I did this talk quite a while ago, someone in the audience raised their hand and said, Rolf, how do you kill a hippo? Now, I strongly recommend it against that. That's not ethical but you can do certain things to tame the hippo. And let's get back to that in a moment. But what, what's at stake here is that the boss, the manager, is asking you to do something for which we actually have a name. It's called the dark pattern. We have one of them here, magazine, and it's all here in very small letters. Dark patterns are always in small letters in small type, or they are a, a light gray type on a blindingly whack, a white background. Let me magnify this to you and show you the, clear, the pattern. Magazine Boutique has offers and information that we can only send you by email. We, we do not want you to miss out 
But if you would prefer not to hear from us, please tick here. Ha ha ha. How clever. Surely a lot of people will notice that one and will not take it because that's usually the safe option. So that's one example of a dark pattern. Here's another one. Sears, very respected American um, department store, looking for our best deals. Show me the deals. No thanks, I don't like deals. <laughs> And even the good people at Google sometimes start doing this kind of thing. Um, it's here. Switch to the latest version of Gmail on your phone. Yes, I want it. I don't want smarter email. <laughs> so that's another way of being evil or perhaps not quite ethical towards your users by having things like that. Now, let's get back here. A client has asked you, and this now we're getting back to the boss. Instead of saying the client, I could have said here, the boss has asked you to implement a dark pattern on a website in order to convince users to sign up for a newsletter. A colleague argues that the dark pattern is unethical because it cheats users into getting something they don't want. So my question to you is, do you implement the dark pattern? Good. Let's have it, and I'm curious about this one. Ah. I tell the client I don't want to do it. All right, and then it's about equal, much smaller number of people who said they would implement it, and it depends. Now, I have a version, I'm not going to show that to you, but I have a version of the dilemma where a few days later, the boss will actually Consider who's up for promotion, or even worse, who will be fired in the next round of uh, 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 cut-downs in the company. And then it starts to get really serious. I don't want you to vote on that one. Yes, there's a question. Yeah, I have a small comment. Uh, so we start patterns and uh, sign up cups in newsletters by default. It's not going to be actually a big of a problem after the 25th of May when the new GDPR takes comes into play because actually the law forbids to do that. Okay, so this lady is saying that after May 25th this will be illegal. Yeah, exactly, and I feel like it's, it, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of talk about the new person data forwarding in Danish, uh, in media and all that, and um, actually everyone who works on developing digital pro pro products um, will have to know those rules in order to make products that actually are in compliance with the law. So All right. I feel that actually in this case, mine as the UX designer's uh, responsibility is to say to my boss or whoever it is that says you have to implement this, that I'm not going to do this, not only because I respect my okay. uh, the, the users, but also well, because I protect against the law. We used, yes, and I agree with you, law-abiding people will never do this kind of stuff, or will they? Because for many years there have been other laws, not this one, and they have been circumvented in clever ways by very, very clever people who of course did not want to uh, disregard the law but had their own interesting interpretations. So, but, but your point is taken and let's see if that makes any difference whether it will disappear or whether if it appears anyone will actually do something about it. Right, so I think this is what I would do. If the client demands a dark pattern, I can strongly advise against it and explain why. If the client still demands a dark pattern, then I'm going to give, it, to give them the dark pattern since they're paying me to build what they want. So it's also a question of whether as an employee you are supposed to do what the client wants you to do. 
I think this is a reasonable answer. Tell the client it doesn't work. If the client insists, do it, unless it's directly, uh, 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 unless it's, it's very bad what they want you to do. Number four, to test or not to test. Is there anyone here in this room who is not familiar with the concept of usability testing? Not familiar with it. Good. Then I'll skip this slide. It explains the very basics of a usability test. And here's how it would look in practice with the usability test participant to the left and the moderator to the right and the evil eye staring at the usability <laughs> test participant up here. Yeah, and this is a situation we should avoid. Like one of my friends uh, uh, tells me, after a usability test, the usability test participant should feel at least as good as before the test. I've actually seen, I've not seen exactly this happen, but I've seen some situations in usability tests where the test participant was clearly not comfortable about what was going on. So here's a dilemma. You have set up usability tests of a prototype with nurses at a medical facility. Nurses' time is guarded carefully. The nursing managers insist on taking the test themselves first and then on being present in the room during the tests to be sure the nurses do it right. You have evidence that the manager's presence will be intimidating to the nurses. So again, it comes back to this, what do you do if the manager says so and so and the ethical principle says don't do it? So do you continue with the usability tests and let the managers observe the nurses. Yes, thank you. Okay, so a clear majority says no, the managers can't observe the nurses. And that's what I would, I would certainly have voted for C2. So uh, I agree with the majority. Yeah, I said that already. There's actually a, there are several codes of professional conduct and you might want to study them. This one is the UXPA International's Code of Professional Conduct. Um, as I've shown here on this slide, it's in my opinion pretty unusable. Act in the best interest of everyone. Bah. Be honest with everyone, of course. Do no harm and, if, if possible, provide benefits. Yes, what else? It becomes a little more interesting if you look at the detailed instructions or the detailed explanations for each of these guidelines. Act in the best interest of everyone. You ex practitioners shall be aware of relevant standards, principles, and generally accepted you ex methods. So you have an obligation for continuing education. Let's take the last one, provide all resultant data. You ex practitioners shall accurately report both the positive and negative feedback from you ex activities. Now, I don't know about you, but I've seen lots of usability test reports that did not contain one single positive finding. That's actually against this uh, guideline because it says you must report the positive and negative findings. Yes, yes, I know very well that there are some usability testers who will now protest and say, Rolf, I had a website, it was so terrible that there was absolutely nothing positive to say about it. I don't believe that. It's because we often take the positive things for granted. But we can see the flaws. Ah, 
spelling error. Out with that. So, right. So, what can you do? And as you can hear, I'm approaching the end of my talk. Show empathy for others. If you don't have empathy, you may not be, you may not want to do usability testing, for instance. You may not want to do interviews. UX professionals work with people. Not everyone can do it properly. Discuss ethical dilemmas openly with peers, colleagues, and with your union, if you've got one. Lots of reasonable things can come out of discussions with peers. You must realize ethics is a non-trivial problem and may involve inconvenient trade-offs. It may involve, it's not just always my little pony grazing on a green, green, green meadow. Sometimes it may involve unpleasant situations where you have to say no. The dilemma is, of course, you are not supposed to hurt people. Well, that's not a dilemma, but the dilemma can come in when you realize that the people that you don't want to hurt are users and co-workers and clients. Often the dilemmas represent a trade-off between hurting as few of these groups as possible. Yes. That's my summary. That's what I've been trying desperately to tell you here in the past 30 minutes. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? <laughs>